as the Allies made plans for the Normandy invasion, Europe's terrible loss of property and culture were not ignored. Eleven days before D-Day, General Eisenhower dispatched a message to all his field commanders that read, Inevitably in the path of our advance will be found historical monuments and cultural centers which symbolize to the world all that we are fighting to preserve. It is the responsibility of every commander to protect and respect these symbols wherever possible. People in the art establishment in the United States managed to persuade uh, Roosevelt and the Army Command to assign a few officers who were mostly art historians, people who'd been at museums, to each army group uh, who would be responsible for buildings that they ran into on the way and also later on for movable works of art. This small team of American and British officers was called the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives Group, or MFA and A. But their mission wasn't taken very seriously by the fighting army. At the time of the invasion, there could not have been more than maybe 10 MFNA officers in the invasion. Not more than that. They had no authority. They had never been issued a vehicle. They had no way of getting around. And naturally, uh, they must have appeared a little bit weird because most GIs could care less whether a painting was saved or not. Although their primary mission was finding and protecting lost treasures and bringing aid to historic buildings damaged by the Germans, one of their most difficult tasks was preventing Allied troops from causing further damage. One soldier said once that after you've been in a battle and you come into a beautiful chateau, then you just absolutely have to shoot at the chandeliers, I mean, just to blow off steam. But by the spring of 1945, one incredible discovery gave the MFA and A the respect it was looking for. On April 4th, General Patton's 3rd Army occupied the village of Merkers and learned the local salt mine could contain a substantial quantity of loot. On April 7th, a small group took the six-minute elevator ride 1,600 feet below the surface and discovered a treasure chest of unimaginable proportions. What lay before them was a maze of 35 miles of tunnels filled with 285 tons of gold bars and coins, over $520 million worth of Reichsmarks and foreign currency, 1,200 crates of priceless art, including works by Rembrandt, Raphael, Van Dyck, and Renoir. The Americans had captured more than 90% of the German gold and currency reserves, as well as masterpieces from 15 Berlin museums. The discovery at Merkers was of such significance that on April 12th, Generals Eisenhower, Bradley, and Patton all came to inspect the mine. At Siegen Mine, they found the treasure of Charlemagne, in Nuremberg, they discovered the Austrian crown jewels. In the mountain near Mittenwald, they unearthed 728 gold bars. And at Alt Aussee Mine in Austria, they captured 7,000 paintings and 3,000 boxes of art objects destined for Hitler's Linz Museum. One of the greatest scores in the hunt for art was when the 101st Airborne captured Goering's collection near the towns of Berchtesgaden and Unterstein. Goering had rushed his treasures from Karenhall south in two trains in order to keep them out of the hands of the Russians. Some of the valuables were hidden in a bunker, but many were pillaged by civilians before the Americans arrived. Those carloads at Unterstein were looted by German civilians and they had an absolute feast. It was like ants crawling just to loot everything out of there. There were some elderly women that came in there to loot the train. The rugs were so large they wouldn't fit in their homes, so they tucked their rugs there and cut them in quarters so they could fit in their homes. And these were old 18th, 17th century rugs they were cutting up. His collection sort of scattered all over the town of Berchtesgaden. Also there was his curator, Walter Hofer, who 
uh, just acted as if nothing at all had happened. He greeted uh, uh, the arts officers who were all museum people as if he'd seen them last week and he asked about friends in New York and, <laughs> and he showed off the whole collection to uh, the press and he, he gave the impression that everything had been legally bought. But he was quickly silenced and put in jail and the true story soon emerged, but it was quite a performance. Later at the Nuremberg trials, MFA and A investigators questioned Goering about the origin of his collection. A uh, member of the MFA and A interrogated Goering. He obtained the satisfaction of being the one to break the news to Goering that the painting uh, that he most valued in his huge collection, the one that he'd actually paid money for, not just confiscated, that that painting was a fake. Goering couldn't believe it. At that moment, Goering looked like a person who, for the first time in his life, had discovered that there was evil in the world. Through it all, the MFA and A continued their work. By 1949, some three million paintings and objects of art looted by the Nazis were returned to their homes in 14 nations. By 1951, the work of the MFA and A was complete.